Welcome. Last time we talked about parasitic drag, which was the combination of skin friction and pressure drag together. We're going to talk now about induced drag. If you uh, followed, the, we had a discussion in class, and if all of that made sense to you, you can skip to the next video where we get into the math. Um, here I'm going to review some of the things that we talked about just to make sure if you, if you want some review, um, then stick around. We're going to go through the physical motivation. All right, so induced drag. Well, uh, I asked you, if you haven't done this, uh, I'll ask you to do it now, to predict what does drag look like for an airplane as a function of velocity. So on the x-axis velocity, y-axis drag is the total drag of the airplane. What happens is I increase in speed going from zero up to higher speeds. Okay, and if you haven't done it, pause, take a moment, try to predict that. As I've gone around and looked, uh, the most common thing I see is something that looks like, say, this. I've seen various variations. Sometimes it looks linear. Sometimes it starts at some higher value or plateaus. But most commonly it looks something like this. OK, so that means zero drag at zero velocity, which makes sense. And it increases, uh, well, it actually increases quadratically. And in fact, this is correct if it was a car not for an airplane, right? And uh, we've all experienced this somewhat. If you've been uh, in a moving vehicle, put your hand out the window, you can feel that the drag certainly increases. Maybe you can't feel it as quadratic, but you certainly feel it increases. Uh, but this actually is not correct for an airplane, which then begs the question, what is different about an airplane as compared to say a car? Actually for an airplane, it looks something more like this. And I drew that really bad, but I'll try it again. It's hard to draw this, but let's say something like this. I made them kind of asymptote to the same, but that's just coincidental, okay? The point is that, yes, indeed, at the higher speeds, as the, as the velocity increases, the drag increases quadratically, but we also get really high drag at low speeds. So what is different about an airplane as compared to a car? Another question we might ask ourselves is why do birds fly like this? Those of you who are cyclists probably know that when you're cycling, you get a, a big boost. You get a reduction in drag if you follow really closely behind uh, someone else in the peloton. Birds don't fly like that. Well, there are some extra caveats there, but generally if, if they were fixed wing, of course, they would not fly like that. Why? What is going on? What is different about birds as compared to bikes? What is it about flight that's different? So this is a question to ponder. One more sort of thinking exercise here. If I had an airplane, and forget about the landing gear, it's flying, an airplane that flew through the screen right here. Okay, and so I've got this blank canvas, air just sitting here still, airplane passed by. What would the air do when the airplane went through? I'd like you to try and draw a vector field with the air you know, just stay there? Would it move in some direction? How would it move? Would it move in different places in different directions? Take a minute and just try and draw that. And this is actually what it looks like more or less. What do we notice from this figure? Well, first, underneath the aircraft, we see a lot of downward moving air. Okay, the air is being pushed downward. That should make sense. Why is that? Well, Let's think back to what is lift. Lift means that the air is pushing the aircraft up, okay? By some means, we designed a vehicle, we're moving it in such a way that the air is pushing us up. It's generating a net force up. And I'm not exactly defining up here, but let's just be, let's just be general here. It's just going up. All right, now, that means by Newton's third law that the airplane must push the air down, right? Okay, so if we push air down, and we see that in the picture, uh, it doesn't just go straight down forever though. What happens is it actually will create this big circulation motion, okay? There are many ways to think about why that would happen, but uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the main first concept that we really have to understand is that 
this is a consequence of lift. We call this downwash. And, and, and if we are leaving momentum behind, right, we've pushed air down, that means we must have drag, right? Because if there was no drag, the air would be still, we would fly through, the air would still be still, 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 right? Nothing changed, that would mean there was no drag. But because we've left some energy behind in the form of uh, momentum in the fluid, then we've lost some energy, there is drag. Notice actually that this argument has nothing to do with viscosity. Even if I could make this a perfectly frictionless world, right, no viscosity, this drag would still exist if I create lift. So to say it another way, I cannot have lift without drag. And we call this type of drag lift dependent drag or induced drag, just another name for the same thing. Okay, and we'll see briefly why later why induced, why call it induced, but uh, commonly referred to as induced drag. Again, to repeat, it's inviscid, has nothing to do with viscosity, just a consequence of lift. Because the air is pushing me up, I have left, pushed the air down, I've left momentum behind. Okay, so why does it circulate? Well, one explanation we sometimes see, which is kind of true maybe, is that we've got maybe a high pressure here and a low pressure here. And so the air is gonna kind of leak around that wing tip. I mean, that's somewhat true. The air is generally gonna be lower on the upper surface, higher on the upper surface, certainly to generate lift. Um, so there's some truth to that. It's a bit incomplete though, uh, because it suggests things that, for example, if we have winglets, right? that maybe we can suppress that, we suppress that tip vortex. Or if we create a box wing, we completely box this off, um, there's no wing tip, then how does the air flow around? Maybe it doesn't. Uh, we should know though from the argument we just made that this must happen because the box wing is still gonna generate lift, there still must be downwash, and actually we're still gonna get this kind of circulation uh, it's actually more a consequence of the way a lift distribution uh, is going to look like. It must have some sort of slope to it, and that slope, that derivative, is uh, related to the vorticity. And we call it a tip vortex, but really it's not a tip phenomenon. It's the entire wing or the entire aircraft that contributes to it. It's just that the vorticity happens to be generally strongest at the tips because of actually the slope of that lift is going to be highest there. So we get a real concentration, but there's vorticity everywhere. There's a circulation everywhere. It all kind of contributes. You might think of it also as there's kind of this void, right? If I've got this air coming down, well, air must come up. Something's got to fill that, so air is going to come up, and it just happens that it's going to circulate around. This circulation is a consequence of lift. And again, like I said, there are many ways to think of it, but it's, in general, probably more accurate to think of it not just as this tip effect, it's really a full airplane effect um, and it's a consequence of lift, not just a tip. We can't eliminate the tip or we could eliminate the tip, but there will still be a circulation. We have to have the circulation to have lift. Okay, um, let's see. One more thing I was going to say. Well, actually what I was going to say is there are actually a lot of good videos if you just hop on YouTube. You can go see a lot of these visualizations. This is just a still picture, but I'd encourage you to go do that. Um, you can go see these things uh, uh, visually in a video form. But here's a crop duster flying through some smoke. You can see the right side. You can see that circulation, kind of like almost like a mini tornado. And there's two on each side. They're counter rotating uh, in this way. If we were to look at a slice of the wing, like uh, just the velocity field, if I just took a straight line like through the plane of the wing, it would look something like this. So we see downward moving air uh, in between, or, or not exactly in wingtip to wingtip, but kind of uh, near where the airplane is. And then outboard of the airplane, because it's spiraling, right, it's coming down inboard, it must come up outboard. So this should help us answer that question about birds. Why is it that birds fly the way they do? Well, we can see that because of this vortex, right, we're pushing air down. So I don't actually want to be straight behind another airplane because then I'm in this region of downward seeking air. But if I can get behind the airplane and to the side, now I'm in this region of 
rising air on the side. It's almost like I've got a little bit of, I do, it's like I'm kind of riding a thermal. I've got some free lift. It's a bit imbalanced, right? I've got more lift on one side of the airplane than the other, so I will have to adjust, right? And birds can do that, and airplanes can do that too. We can change our ailerons or control surfaces so that we're almost like surfing, kind of tilted a bit, uh, although we would be level because now we have lift coming up. So we can do this. It reduces the amount of lift we have to create and thus the amount of drag that we experience. And so the birds or the airplanes that fly properly in formation will use less energy and can fly further. Uh, here's another view of that. Uh, here we can see those what we call trailing vortices. That's what these are. And those vortices we saw was like if we were in a plane right here, right, and we we're looking from behind, see these two spiral vortices. But we can see it continues all the way around. And if you follow those arrows, it's like everywhere in this rectangle, air is going down. Over here it's coming up. Over here it's coming up. Over here it's coming up. Okay, so this is just kind of a picture of what's happening um, with downwash. Uh, again, key ideas here. This uh, downwash is fundamental to lift creation. We cannot have lift without creating some drag, and we call this drag lift drag, or lift dependent drag, or induced drag. So we saw, or we talked about why birds um, fly in, the, in these formations. We didn't exactly talk about why does the drag get high at low speeds, right? We, the first thing we talked about was that the drag kind of has this curve to it. It doesn't just go down to zero, but it actually goes up as we get to lower and lower speeds. We're gonna have to wait a little bit to see that when we get into the math. But uh, fundamentally, we should think about the fact that we have to, at, at these low speeds, one way you can think about it is that if we're, difference in the car is that we're still trying to gener generate lift if we're flying really slow, we're actually gonna have to generate really high lift coefficients in our airplane to get the lift that we need. And this is actually gonna make us less efficient. We're gonna have even more drag than we would have otherwise. So low speed is actually an inefficient way to generate that lift. As we get to really high speeds, this lift dependent drag goes down, but our parasitic drag goes up. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit next time. Uh, this is just gonna be, this is just a really brief review for those of you who missed or need a recap of some of the physics. Um, the next one we'll get into uh, some of the math. So hop to the next video if you want to get into that.